sure there'll be a few more stragglers coming in. My name is Paula Cushing. I'm curator of invertebrate zoology here. And it is my great pleasure to welcome our third science pop-up lecture uh, speaker, Dr. Gussie McCracken. And Gussie is our brand spanking newest curator here. She's, this is her one month anniversary. <clears throat> Gussie is the curator of paleobotany here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. She studies fossil plants and their ecological interactions in deep time. She focuses on reconstructing ancient landscapes during the late Cretaceous, the age of the dinosaurs, across the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction and into the first million years of the Paleogene, the age of the mammals, to understand how ecosystems rebuild after mass extinctions and climate change. Prior to becoming curator here uh, of paleobotany, she was a postdoc fellow funded through the National Science Foundation. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Colorado College and her PhD from the University of Maryland College Park, where she conducted her research at the Smithsonian. Uh, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome Gussie to, to the stage where she will be speaking about the fossils beneath our feet at the Denver International Airport. Yeah, let's see, can everybody hear me okay? Great, um, good, that's on. Can we get the lights down just like a hair, please? Awesome, so thank you all for coming today. Um, and I actually wanna thank Paula um, for organizing the pop-up lectures and uh, I want to thank everybody who's helping kind of get the rooms all set up. Thank you, Ollie. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about the paleontology of the Denver International Airport. Um, and I figured the, the most important reason to do this is so that when you're stuck at the airport with your family and friends, you can bore them with fun paleo facts. <laughs> <laughs> But also, what I wanted to do really was um, to think about us as Coloradans, as Denverites, people here you know, who work in Denver, um, and how we interact with deep time, whether we know it or not, um, and really how the museum has been a part of our culture and our, our institutions here in Denver, and uh, how we influence the way that the public sees our city. So first is kind of a silly question. Who here has flown in and out of DIA? Dang, like everyone. <laughs> cool, all right. Who here, oh, is it gonna go? There we go. Who here flew out of the old airport uh, in Denver, and we shall not name that airport. I'll just call it the old one. That's now in what we call City Park. Great, a few of us, yeah. Um, so if you were around in Denver and flying in and out of this older airport in Denver, then you might remember the, the construction and all the hubbub around um, DIA, our new airport. So just a quick, quick little history about uh, DIA. Um, Denver, the mayor, wanted to expand the airport, but obviously where it was in City Park, the old one, um, was a little bit cramped. Uh, so they proposed in the early 80s to find a new site for the, the airport here in Denver. And um, it took about 10 years to be able to break ground, but they, they broke ground in about 1989 which is an easy number for me to remember because that is my birthday. So I'll be talking about things that I was not physically there for, but um, very fun to know about anyway. So this is a photo, an aerial photo, of uh, the airport of DIA being constructed. And um, when, I guess I'll have to stick closer to my laptop, okay. Uh, so this is one of the pits for one of the main terminals that um, they dug into. And uh, it's this beautiful kind of Oreo-like rock. You can see a lot of white and 
kind of black stripes, the black is coal, the white is ash. Um, and what's fabulous about the construction of the airport is that they had to dig big holes and they had to flatten out long distances for the, the runways. In fact, I think DIA has the longest runway in the US and maybe the seventh longest runway in the world. Um, I don't know why, but that's cool. Uh, <laughs> and when they were digging out the, the runways, the terminals, construction workers came across um, a lot of fossils that looked like this. And uh, at first, they were kind of warned, like, don't tell anybody, it'll slow construction. And this is important, right, because um, DIA was about three years, it opened about three years later than anticipated, and cost about $3 billion more than they budgeted for. Um, so everyone here in Denver helped pay for that extra $3 billion, but uh, I don't know. It's a cool airport, it's nice, I like it. Um, so, so they found a bunch of these cool fossils, and um, a, a construction worker did end up you know, convincing people came forward and contacted Richard Stuckey, who was a curator here at the time. Um, this is like 1989. And in fact, uh, I have to say thank you to Jeff Stevenson for uh, regaling me with tales of DIA construction um, because he was actually on the ground uh, during this first discovery. So the construction workers actually thought that these fossils were of fish um, which would be fun, but uh, they're not. They're of fossil palms, which excites me way more than fish. So really, what the construction workers at DIA found was a forest, an ancient forest. Um, and so the main plant that we find there um, under DIA are all of these gorgeous palm fronds. Oh, yeah, sorry. I keep wandering. <laughs> And so um, this is what we think the forest would have looked like about 65 million years ago. We have these kind of palm-like forests, and they also have a few other things. It's not a very diverse forest, but there are things like these, um, these platinides, these ancient sycamores that were growing here. Um, I've pulled up a, just a quick image of one of our um, sycamores from DIA in the collections. You can kind of see the same shape leaf there. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay. And so um, by about 1991, the, uh, the museum was deeply involved in um, finding fossils at DIA. Um, and one of the things that was really exciting was that now we have a new curator of paleobotany, Dr. Kirk Johnson. And he did not care as much for the fossils, per se, because um, palms are sort of everywhere uh, in Denver. They're not that special, even though they're very cool. Um, but he was more excited about the geology, because this site uh, had ash beds, and we can use ash beds to date the rocks. And when they dated the rocks, they came out to 65 million years old. And now why is that important? Because 66 million years ago, one million years earlier, an asteroid the size of Denver came down, hit uh, the Earth off the coast of Mexico, and basically decimated about 75% of all life on Earth um, at that time. About 60% of plant species in North America went extinct, um, as well as the dinosaurs and a bunch of other things. So as Tyler Leeson likes to say, it was the worst day on Earth for life ever. Just a complete catastrophe. Um, so that's why an age of 65 million years old for the uh, fossil forest under the Denver International Airport is so exciting because it shows us how the Earth recovered after an extinction event. So when we as paleontologists are trying to look for a site that uh, captures this period of time, say the late Cretaceous, the end of the age of dinosaurs, 
um, to 66 million years ago, that mass extinction event. And after, and looking at the restructuring of ancient ecosystems, we look for rocks sort of like this, where you find dinosaurs below, and then absolutely none above. And what's great about where we live right now, we're actually incredibly lucky, um, is that we live in what's called the Denver Basin. And so this is sort of a bowl of rocks that um, outcrop all over Denver, um, actually all over uh, kind of the, the front range. So it goes from about Denver to Lyman, Colorado Springs in the south to about Greeley. And the rocks that outcrop are Cretaceous. Those are gonna be the green layers that you see there and um, the D1 and D2 uh, sequences of the Denver formation in brown, which are um, cover after the, the asteroid hit down. Well, some of the late Cretaceous and some of the Paleogene. So if you were to take a knife and slice where we live um, and look at it from the side, you would actually see that we are right here in this nice little bowl area. We have the kind of older sediments to younger, um, and it gives us kind of a sense of what the ground below our feet looks like. And so we can actually trace all of the geology around the basin, which was work done by um, Marika Deshesny at the USGS, Bob Reynolds here, who I see in the audience, um, and Kirk Johnson. And we can kind of model out where we think that boundary, that mass extinction event would, have, would be outcropping around the basin. So you can actually see here is where we think that Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction event boundary occurred. And the airport is right up um, close to that, which makes sense. Um, so one of the, I'm gonna kind of go away from the airport for just a little bit because you know a palm forest is very exciting, but there are also exciting things found under infrastructure around the Denver Basin as well. And so one of those was the discovery of Castle Rock in uh, 1994. So Kirk Johnson again found, uh, and he's a big he's a big human being, and that is a big leaf right there. Um, so Kirk Johnson. Uh, was called down to the um, construction of I-25 when they were expanding it in the early 90s. And um, the uh, CDOT paleontologist had found some leaves. And so he goes down and starts finding more and more and more leaves at this site. And what's exciting is that this site is about one and a half, two million years after that mass extinction event but it records this tremendously diverse forest. So we're finding huge leaves. I mean, a foot long, they look like they come from a tropical rainforest today because we think that they came from a tropical rainforest in the fossil record. And it's actually the earliest known tropical rainforest. So anytime you're driving down to the springs or through Castle Rock, uh, you're gonna know that you're driving right over this incredible fossil treasure trove um, that preserves a beautiful in situ forest, meaning that we can see where the plants were growing, um, what position they were. Sometimes we even get things like the root structure, the stem, and the leaf. So it's kind of fun to think about, um, you know, the, the ground that we walk over, right? telling tales of, of how ecosystems on Earth have changed through time. Obviously, we don't live in a tropical rainforest today. We have um, you know, a shortage of water. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see how Colorado has changed through time and also through space. I'm just gonna bring it up real quickly, um, but we're, we're trying to still fill in that picture of how ecosystems changed here in Colorado after the KPG extinction event. Um, so a lot of the work that the team in the Earth Sciences Department is doing right now is trying to figure out what the forests looked like, what the animals looked like, and the pace of recovery, and then maybe expanding that into other parts of the American West. Um, so we actually work down below Castle Rock in the springs, and we also get these incredible palm forests that are growing 
about you know, 300,000 years or so, uh, about one to 300,000 years after the KPG. Um, so what I, what I mean to say with bringing up all these different little, or big, honestly, um, excavations, is that we're getting snapshots of these ecosystems. And then what do we do with the snapshots? Well, we wanna put them together. So one of the things I'm really interested in doing is figuring out how we go from a forest of palm trees um, at 65 and some million years ago to a tropical rainforest in Castle Rock um, just shortly after that. And one of the things that we can do is find floras in the Denver Basin that are between those ages. So one of the ones that we have, or a couple of them that we have, um, one called Scotty's Palm, the other is called Baptist Road. Those floras are found kind of near the airport, um, the, uh, the Air Force Academy, um, and also down in North Colorado Springs. They actually preserve fossil forests that are not, they're pretty diverse, so they're not quite like that, that palm tree forest that just had the same things over and over again. But they're not as diverse as the tropical rainforest in Castle Rock either. Um, so what I think that's telling us is that um, we have the beginnings of the earliest rainforest, maybe taxonomically. So maybe we're gonna find some of the, the same types of plants, um, but also the same type of plant morphologies, uh, things like drip tips. You can see the tip of this leaf is actually quite long. That's, a, that's an adaptation to wet environments because if you're in a very wet environment, you don't want water pooling on your leaf because maybe you would get more fungal infections. So it helps to um, drip the water down off the leaf. So I think what we're seeing here are some really interesting kind of um, middle of the road precursors to the, the ancient um, uh, rainforest. And if you were at Henry Fricke's talk um, this week, then um, you would have heard something about uh, looking at the fossil record to think about rainfall and precipitation. So one of the interesting things too in the Denver Basin is that the closer you are to the mountains, the more rainfall you got. And so we think that because these, you know, Scotty's Palm Baptist Road, uh, Castle Rock, those are all pretty close to the mountain range. So we're predicting that there's, you know, essentially a rain shadow effect going on in the fossil record in deep time. So anyway, that's a bit about where I'm going next with my research and thinking about the evolution of modern rainforests. And the one thing I do wanna also note is that um, you would think that rainforests found in Colorado in the fossil record would be a precursor to maybe the neotropical rainforests today. But interestingly enough, the types of plants that we're finding um, in Castle Rock are, if they're around today, they're actually found in Asian rainforests. So that's telling us something too about maybe how climate changed through time. Maybe the earth is, you know, or not maybe, we definitely know, the earth is, uh, goes through periods of warming where plants are able to um, go over poles, um, just like at this time in the Cretaceous and the Paleogene, we can even find um, palm trees growing up into Alaska. So it tells us something about the movement of plants, how they expand their ranges, and something about how Earth's climate has changed through time. And now I wanna kind of bring sort of the, the talk back into our place as humans in Denver today, um, because the discovery of the fossils at DIA um, were the inspiration for, or one of the inspirations for, a series called Ancient Denvers. And you can actually buy this book. I'm not sure if it's in the bookshop, but it should be. Um, and so um, Kirk and team commissioned a series of paintings that depict what Denver looked like through time. And I think it starts at like 300 and some million years ago and goes up to about 16,000 years ago. So it's really incredible that you can see 
how we've changed through time. You know, sometimes Denver is underwater. Sometimes it's a it's a tropical rainforest. Sometimes it's an arid grassland. And uh, what's also great about these illustrations is that they're at the convention center today. Have you guys seen them? Yes, no, a few of you. Well, if you go to a convention or if you do anything at the convention center, hunt these down because they're incredibly beautiful and they're enormous. Um, and they really give you a sense of how, how you know, Colorado has changed. And I just brought up a couple to kind of show you what it would look like here 16,000 years ago um, and also 70 million years ago. I think I'd rather be here 16,000 years ago. <laughs> and then, um, you know, kind of bringing it right back to DIA, uh, you can walk around and although I know that they were hesitant to bring in the Denver Museum, uh, because they might slow down construction and cost them three billion dollars or whatever. Um, <laughs> they actually celebrate the fossil discoveries that uh, have been found in Denver. A lot of those fossil discoveries are ones that people here at DMNS have made. And so um, you can see some cool little dinosaurs, ammonites, uh, and then this one. I would have gotten a better photo, but I was in the women's bathroom and. It was, it felt awkward. <laughs> Snapping photos. Um, <laughs> but they really did a beautiful job of integrating, you know, what's under your feet at the Denver airport um, and what's all around Colorado into the beautiful artwork that you can see in the airport, in the convention center. Um, Ancient Denver's is also uh, posted here in the museum up outside of Prehistoric Journey. So if you're walking um, down that long hallway after the exhibit, take a look at those. So they're seen by thousands of people, tens and hundreds of thousands of people. And then um, <laughs> I also want to pitch uh, that James Hagedorn, our curator of geology, does an incredible job of outreach. Um, and so they, they post them all over social media platforms. and. Um, we don't just have fossils represented at DIA. We actually have the straight up old hey Everybody, geology. this is James Hagedorn from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Do you know where I am? I'm downstairs at Denver International Airport. And you know what's really cool? Is as you get off the train to enter the main terminal, you're surrounded by awesome Colorado geology. And it's not just underfoot, or is it? Check it out, right down here. We've got slabs of amazing granite with huge feldspar crystals, these big pink things in here, just like what forms on our Pikes Peak. And the mountainscape behind me here, this is one of our, of our state's most commonly used building stones, the Lion Sandstone, a 280 million year old sandstone that's used to clad buildings from the University of Colorado, our airport, and many a patio in between. And what's above them up here, above the mountainscape, is this amazing white stone. That is our state rock, the Yule Marble, in all of its magnificence. <laughs> and I, I can't leave the stage without at least mentioning the fact that there is nothing going on underneath DIA except for a beautiful fossil forest. There's not the Illuminati, no aliens, all kind of crazy lizard people. If you're out there, I don't know. No, I'm kidding. Um, but, you know, to, to <laughs> just to the end the talk, you know, we live in an incredible place. We have one of the best fossil records um, on Earth right here in Colorado. And the basin that we sit in today captures some of the most incredible moments in time that I'm lucky enough to be able to dig up with colleagues and um, collaborators all over. And so, you know, I just want to say thank you for all you do. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm happy to take questions if you have any. <laughs> Thank you.
We have plenty of time for questions, and there's some fossils for people to take a look at before you leave. Thanks, Gussie. That was great. Um, I just have a kind of a, a practical question. Yeah. What's the legal responsibility for for large cons or any kind of construction, road building, major buildings, in terms of bringing in archaeologists and or anthropologists, for that matter? But I'm thinking particularly of archaeology. Oh, and archaeology. Well, or uh, geology. I'm sorry. Anything interesting. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I actually don't know um, the answer to that. I know that we have a, um, a CDOT paleontologist who is supposed to monitor um, major construction, um, but I don't know what the, the rules are. What I do know is the fact that um, DMNS has a really good record of working with construction, both public construction and private. So like when we were at Snowmass, um, you know, I think it was a really nice thing for both the project and the people on the project and the paleontologists going in. Um, it, was, it was a really wonderful experience where we didn't hold them up too long and the things that came out of it were, were wonderful. So I do wanna, I wanna kind of shout out to DMNS and all of the people that have um, given us a great reputation in the past for, you know, coming in, being quick, excavating, a, you know, Taurosaurus from Thornton, getting people excited and then leaving. <laughs> Actually, can you hold off, Bob? We're recording this just as a reminder, so. Oh. Hey, Paula, thanks. Uh, well, Gussie, I just wanted to bring up the, the concept of the linkage between vegetation and climate, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. and uh, clearly the climate is changing today, and I'm wondering if, um, as you look at your the records of the past, if you can uh, see guidance into the future. Um, so I'm sort of trying to tease out some of the deeper relevance of the research that, that you and others here in the building are doing. Yeah, so, um, you know, that's a really burgeoning field in paleontology. It's uh, what we'd like to think of as um, conservation paleobiology. How can we take the past and maybe predict what's happening today with um, our changing climate caused by humans. So, um, you know, there, my, my field of study for my dissertation was actually looking at plant insect associations. And um, one of the things that uh, really stands out is that in a warmer climate, um, insects eat more of a plant. It has to do with the nutrition of the plant. So when you get more carbon dioxide, higher levels of carbon dioxide, the ratio between carbon, which insects don't really need, and nitrogen changes. And so the plants become less nutritious and insects therefore have to eat more of a forest to get that same level of nutrition. So what we see in kind of warmer climates is that we're gonna get more insect herbivory, which does impact us today because, you know, of agroecosystems, right? So we can maybe expect to see more insect herbivory on our crops, and maybe we need to um, kind of figure out how to, you know, get around that, or, or, you know, do something sustainable so that we're not just, uh, you know, spraying chemicals on every field all the time, um, and promoting insects getting, um, essentially, adapting to the chemical pesticides that we use. So that's one thing that I've seen in my own research um, during warm climates that can contribute to how we handle our climate today. Um, but yeah, in terms of what comes back after disturbance in the fossil record, we can also think about things like that. Um, how mammals change after extinction events, how plants change, I think it's relevant to a point because we're going through an incredibly quick um, climate change. And so the KPG, as you know, is, is um, in some ways a very apt comparison. I have a question about collecting plant fossils, since I don't do that. Um, when you have something like an airport and you find an entire forest of fossils and you know you have limited time to get those because they want to put their airport in place, but you know you have a 
ton of fossils there and you can never collect them all and you want to get a big sample size, how many do you collect and how do you, how do you make that decision? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, some of our, our statistical analyses, we found that they require about 300 um, leaves to be, to be good enough. Um, I usually aim for maybe 1,000 per quarry if it's really important. Um, but you can also start um, seeing if you're getting new things. So like, let's say you're at, you're at sample 542, um, and all you've collected are palms from this hole in the ground. Uh, do you need 1,000? No, you can probably stop there. Um, so it depends on a bunch of different factors. Um, how many grad students and interns do you have helping? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, what are you finding? How diverse is it? Um, and then what are the statistics that you're trying to run on the site? What are the, the questions that you're trying to answer? Um, so you know, it depends. Sometimes you do small quarries across, say, a runway. Um, and see how the flora changes through space. Um, so yeah, a lot of things to consider, but I like that question, thanks. Anybody else? Well, okay, before, before we end, I did not know how to put this into the presentation, but I thought it was hilarious. Um, it is the DIA open house in 1995, and it's, I feel like it predicts our future. It's the train that goes to the plains. Do we know where we're going? Hold on for departure. Hang on, he said it goes about 30 miles an hour. All right, the train ride between concourses. Many visitors to DIA already a favorite. and we're going to check our bags now. I would trust the baggage system because Wellington said it works. But we're just pretending. We wouldn't really check our bags because who knows where they'd wind up. Yeah. This is Concourse B. Concourse B. <laughs> so anyway, with that, <laughs> thank you all for coming. <laughs>